Hi, my name is Tyler Kirkpatrick and I am the senior pastor here and I want to welcome you to CK Press. We are a church seeking the renewal of our world, our community, and our own lives by following Jesus. We gather weekly on Sundays for our worship service at 10 a.m. And we would love to worship with you here in person, or you can join us online uh, on Facebook or YouTube for our live stream. Our hope is that this will be a place where you encounter the living God and feel the love of a community of faith. If you're new here or would appreciate some more information about us, you can fill out our Connect card, either digitally or on our app, uh, or physically when you're here in person. You can download our app, the app, any app store, uh, by searching CK Press Church. I would also invite you to check out our website, ckpc.org, where you can learn more about our ministries and who we are as a church. We're so glad you're here. Good morning. Well, uh, welcome to worship here uh, at CK Press. It's, it's great to be with you. Uh, and we have a few announcements as we get uh, ready to worship together. Uh, the first is our Connect card. Uh, these are in the seat backs in front of you. So if you would like to fill these out to get involved in any way, uh, you can do that. Again, if you want to be put on our mailing list or our email list, let us know and, and uh, put that in, in, the, in the information. Uh, this is also a great way, uh, if, you, if you'd like prayer for any reason or for somebody uh, that you know, you'd like us to pray over them, uh, you can put that in the prayer request spot, uh, and we pray over these uh, weekly as a staff, and, and that's a, a privilege for us to be able to do that. So you can fill these out and put them in the, in the offering plates as they come by. Uh, just just as, a, as a note, you can also uh, uh, fill this out on the app. There is a way to fill this out on the app. So if you're, if you're during the week, you're like, I really want prayer, uh, you can go on the app and there's a prayer request card there. So you can do that. Update for the garden plant sale. Yesterday was our garden plant sale and it went great. So we just want to thank everybody for uh, their donations uh, to the plant sale. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how much money they, they made, but it seemed to have gone uh, really well. The update is, if you noticed, over uh, in the hallway by the fellowship hall, there's a lot of plant items and a few other items there. So if you donated something and uh, there's a chance it didn't get sold, you can go back and kind of peruse and, and if, if your thing is still there, you can take that home with you or you can uh, leave it there and the garden will definitely put it to good use. Uh, we also wanted to say, if you didn't donate anything and you maybe missed out yesterday and you would still like to go see what's down there, you can go down there and if there's something you like, you can take it. Uh, and, or again, you know, the, the garden will use pretty much everything that's down there. Um, but if you do take something, uh, you don't need to do this, but we would love it if you would uh, go onto the giving platform and donate to the garden fund um, through that. But uh, that's, that's there for you in the hallway by the fellowship hall. Next is, so this is next Sunday. We have Fifth Hymn Sunday at 9.30 a.m. Come a half hour early and... Uh, you know, come with a hymn uh, that you want uh, Shelly to lead us in, uh, and we just, it's a great time of extra singing with the saints together, so uh, you, you just can call out a hymn number from the hymnal, and, and we'll sing it together, so that's next Sunday at 9.30, and then in two Sundays, we have our families and young adults Sunday board games, uh, this is a great uh, opportunity for fellowship, um, and also just to play board games, so if you like board games, or you want to do something uh, that isn't boring on Sunday, you want to have some fun, uh, the Terrible pun, I'm sorry. But you would like to have some fun after church on Sunday. Uh, this is the first Sunday of every month uh, this happens. And so come and join us in two Sundays for our board game. Uh, they're just asking for $5 for pizza, which is a bargain. So that's coming up. Our, this is our uh, obligatory uh, announcement uh, per our bylaws as a church uh, for you members that our annual congregational meeting is coming up Monday, May 15th. Monday, May 15th, we will have dinner at 6 p.m., so that's nice. You don't have to make dinner that night. Dinner at 6 p.m., and then the meeting at 6.30. Uh, so, so get that on your calendars, members. And then uh, this month uh, of May, is uh, the women are having uh, their spring tea. This is their, their one event for the month. Um, it's $5, May 20th, from 2 p.m. to 3.30. There's a sign-up sheet in the Northex, uh, but you can also sign up on Facebook, and I'm sure if you have any questions... You can ask any number of women that are part of that group, uh, and you can also email office at ckpc.org if you have any questions for that. And so with that, I now invite you to stand and greet your neighbors around you.
1 John chapter 3. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we're living truly, living in God's reality. It's also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism, even when there is something to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do ourselves. invite all my friends, fifth grade and younger, to come on up. How are you this morning? Good morning. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Wow, you guys really need to calm down. You're out of control. A little too excited. 
Um, okay, so all month long, we're talking about humility and putting others first. And I was wondering if you guys would help me with some math problems. So some of, so, got my marker ready. Okay, what is this? Eight. Eight, is that right? I can't, I couldn't see. Six plus two. Eight, okay, okay, man, I'm so glad I have you guys. All right, here's the next one. Seven plus four. Ten. Ten, is that right? Eleven. 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 Oh, perfect. Man, you guys are smart. All right, for sure. What's five plus nine? Five plus nine is fourteen. Fourteen, whoa. I'm so glad I have you guys. This is getting done so much faster than I would have thought. What about four plus seven? Fourteen. Thirteen. Thirteen. Thirteen, amazing. Oh, I forgot to write it down. Oh goodness, thirteen. Twelve. 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 Okay, oh good goodness. Okay, last one. Two plus eight, or wait, no, what's that say? Twelve plus eight. Twelve plus eight is what, Rowan? Twenty. Oh, thank you guys, that was so helpful. It made my math homework much easier. Have you guys ever had something in school that was hard to understand? No? Oh, I'm very impressed. Well, I have definitely had things in my life. Um, when we get to Sunday school. Well, um, we... Okay. I'm going to finish telling the children's message, okay? Okay. We, um, have you ever helped a friend with their homework? Anybody? Yeah, you have? Oh, that's great. Yes. Maybe. You have helped friends at school? No. We don't no? Oh, yes, yes, I have, I have, yes, yes. Oh, you don't do homework at school. <laughs> Dumb, Miss Annie. Um, well, have you ever helped um, them understand something that you are really good at that maybe? No. Yes? Awesome. No. Well, You're the... not dumb. Thank you. That was so nice. Um, we can show people we care, and put them first by helping them understand things. And our Bible story today talks about something that Jesus, people really didn't understand. When Jesus died on the cross, people didn't get it. It didn't make sense. But then Jesus helped them understand. And we're going to hear more about that in two men on the road to Emmaus in Sunday school. So friends, let's go ahead and fold our hands and bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for helping us understand. Help us put others first and teach them the things that maybe they don't understand. Maybe they have a hard time even knowing about you, Lord. I pray that you give us the words to be able to share that with others. Thank you so much for my friends here today at church and our, and our Sunday school and all of our, everyone who comes to our church. We can feel you in this place, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, friends, let's head on down. All right, well, uh, as many of you know, uh, we have our uh, conference coming up in May. Uh, this is uh, May 5th and 6th. This is uh, a conference looking at what Jonathan Edwards has to say uh, to us in the 21st century. Um, I, I encourage you to go look at our website, ckpc.org uh, backslash Edwards Conference. Uh, there's a lot of information about Edwards, about our speaker uh, and we also have uh, four blog posts uh, from all of our uh, breakout session uh, speakers. So I encourage you to go read those. Uh, and you'll get a little bit more of an uh, idea of what their breakout sessions will be like. And we get the privilege this morning of hearing from somebody who has 45 years in ministry, at least, uh, and uh, has said that Edwards uh, has done a great uh, deal for him in his ministry. So, oh, yeah, can you, uh, Joe... Tell us, uh, how has Jonathan Edwards impacted your life and your ministry? Well, um, I first, I'm gonna, my workshop is The Divine and Supernatural Light, directly imparted to the soul by the Holy Spirit, proved a rational and scriptural doctrine. And uh, I first read that sermon 53 years ago. And, um, but I, uh, I learned about it in fourth grade Sunday school at First Presbyterian Church in Tacoma. And uh, I didn't know about Edwards, and I don't think the teacher did, but she explained it quite well. Um, in those days, they had a thing called a flannel graph. Anybody? 
and it was this sticky piece of cloth, and you made little pictures, and you put it up. And so I was sitting there, and she put up this heart, and it had scars and holes in it. She'd rubbed dirt on it, and it was just a really messed up heart. And uh, she said, boys and girls, this is our, our heart before we know it the love of God and Jesus Christ. And then she put a bright red heart over the, the heart, and she said, this is the blood of Jesus that covers that all over and absorbs it and kind of deals with it. And then she put a bright yellow heart over the whole thing, and this, she said, this is the light that Jesus Christ brings into our hearts if we believe in him. And I thought to myself, I had this sensation that I couldn't really describe, I didn't have the words then. I knew that was absolutely true, and it was really important, and I felt something about that light while she was talking. So anyway, on with life, and uh, Stadium High School, went to the UW, I was a philosophy major, classical Greek, and uh, I also went to University of Preston Church, and the college group in those days was called the Calvin Club. And uh, I was the only member of the Calvin Club who was a philosophy major in the late 60s at the University of Washington, I think. Um, but uh, that was an interesting time because what was going on was there was the charismatic renewal, this movie, The Jesus Revolution, and, uh, and me and the Calvin Club, because I believed all that Calvinist stuff. Anyway, I ended up at seminary. and. Um, there was, there was a lot of discussion of Calvin, because, of uh, Edwards, because he brought together the Great Awakening renewal kind of thing with high sovereign grace doctrines, and they fit, and that was me. And so that um, sermon has been uh, very powerful over the years. Um, the, uh, So that, that, yeah, that sermon has been really what's guided my theology um, for now 53 years, you know. What so um, we're going to talk in the, in the workshop about um, the divine and supernatural light. And um, if you're a genuine Christian, if you've been converted to Christ, you have had that experience of the divine and supernatural light. Um, and uh, I didn't really understand this. My point was that I didn't really understand what was going on in that Sunday school class until I read Jonathan Edwards in, in, at seminary, and I realized, oh, that's what that was. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's true for, for a lot of us. Um, it's directly imparted to the soul. And... Um, <clears throat> Anyway, we're going to talk about doubt. Edwards had his little spell with doubt, especially on predestination. He figured that out, though, and came through on the right side. And, uh, um, uh, and we're going to talk about um, how it's rational and scriptural, the teaching in that sermon, that divine and supernatural light. And I'll close with this. Um, Edwards had a full manuscript like Tyler, and I had one of those, and, and the full manuscript, the whole nine yards, and he'd read them, not in a dramatic kind of a television evangelist kind of way, just like a Calvinist might read them, a little logical and so forth. And while he was doing that, people were overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit, cried and had all sorts of, you know, the divine and supernatural light, and um, I'm not saying that's going to happen to everybody in the class, but um, it's an important thing to know about, and I'm Honored to be able to do that. Thanks, Joe. Will you, will you pray for us? Yeah. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world, and your presence is here, especially when the gospel is preached. And we pray today that you'd be with the rest of this service, and may your divine and supernatural light be directly imparted to our hearts. We give you the thanks for this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, John. Our song today is Come and Hear the Joyful Singing. And this is, uh, and I would like you to bring you back to um, a, probably around uh, first century France, is what this is trying to evoke. 
um, or, or 10th century, or um, the uh, first millennium France, my apologies, where um, you would just be walking down the street and you would hear somebody just start, start um, singing, out, uh, singing out praise um, and other people would join in and they would bring instruments and it would be a joyful noise and there would be a lot of joyful singing. And I also want to advertise and invite you to June 9th when we are when um, Silva Day Lutheran and us are going to right here um, perform uh, with uh, perform as a combined choir and a combined bell choir and um, celebrate some of the music that we've had this year and I hope you are interested in coming to uh, in coming and celebrating with us at 7 p.m. June 9th. I'll keep on talking about that.
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this summer, our sermon series, and it's, uh, it's not today, it's not summer, as you can tell, uh, it's not summer, but this summer, our sermon series uh, is going to be from the book of Daniel, uh, which is just the strangest book maybe in the whole Bible. You have leopards with wings and foreheads and all kinds of wild things, and yet I was saying to Brittany this week, I think actually in some ways preaching Daniel might be easier than preaching some parts of Paul, because uh, Daniel, as strange as it is, at least most of us come with sort of fresh eyes. Uh, But to Paul, we maybe come with some uh, opinions or some backstory. Uh, So let's pray as we come together to God's Word this morning. Gracious God, we pray that Your Word alone would be spoken this morning, and we pray that Your Word alone would be heard this morning that your divine and supernatural light would be imparted to us, that we would be changed and made more like you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite you, as you're able to, stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning. We are still in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And submit to each other out of respect for Christ. Wives should submit to their husbands as if to the Lord. A husband is the head of his wife, like Christ is the head of the church, that is, the Savior of the body. So wives submit to their husbands in everything like the church submits to Christ. As for husbands, love your wives just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He did this to make her holy by washing her in a bath of water with the word. He did this to present himself with a splendid church, one without any sort of stain or wrinkle on her clothes, but rather one that is holy and blameless. That's how husbands ought to love their their wives, in the same way as they do their own bodies. Anyone who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hates his own body, but feeds it and takes care of it, just like Christ does for the church, because we are parts of his body. This is why a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two of them will be one body. Marriage is a profound mystery, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. In any case, as for you individually, each one of you should love his wife as himself, and wives should respect their husbands. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of God and in the company of saints. So it's been said that uh, Ephesians 5.22 is the first verse and the last verse that many people read of the book of Ephesians. Uh, They're done with it after that. The misapplications of this week's passage and next week's, we'll see, are are myriad and tragic. Uh, This this passage has been pulled out of context to, to justify male supremacy and tyrannical leadership in organizations and churches and governments. Uh, It has been used to justify domestic abuse within marriages, whether emotional or physical. And I'm not going to go any further in this sermon without saying that if you are in a situation like that, you need to know that God grieves for you and with you, and you need to know that you can ask for help. Do not let anyone ever tell you that abuse is somehow part of God's will. Uh, God would see you delivered from that, and we, your church, are here for you, whether you need to find an elder or a staff member. Now, the writings about this week's passage are also myriad and, and voluminous, and, and I actually love that. I love to see the church wrestling honestly with Scripture and with one another about what a text means. Uh, I love it every week except this one, uh, when I'm supposed to write a sermon on something that liberals and conservatives and people everywhere in between have written entire books on, that people hold entire week-long conferences on, that professors devote their careers to. So, if you want some labels that you can apply to yourself or that you can use to make some snap uh, condemning judgments about other people and what they must be like, we can give you those. In conversations around this text, there are egalitarians who see husband and wife on equal footing and complementarians who emphasize a bit more the wife's submission to the husband, drawing also on language from Genesis that that Eve is called Adam's helper. And egalitarians respond and point out that the, the noun helper applied to Eve is 
the same word that's often applied to God. God is our helper, so it can't just mean assistant. And complementarians point to the language of headship. The husband is the head of the wife like Christ is the head of the church and often emphasize leadership and decision-making and authority. And egalitarians respond by pointing to Proverbs 31 and his wife being blessed for going out and making business decisions all by herself, managing the family's affairs. Or they point to something like scholar Scott McKnight's observations, that in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, when the Hebrew word for head, that's rosh, when it means leader or authority, it's always translated with the Greek word archon, not kephale, which is the word that Paul uses here. McKnight says, for Paul, head and origin are close in meaning and move in the direction of life-giving and nourishment. And the passage does not focus on authority over or leading, but on loving and self-sacrificing and giving and nourishing. Using terms like authority and leadership is to add what is not in the text, is what McKnight says. And they, and they say the head and body is really just a way of talking about the one fleshness of marriage, and complementarians say that's nonsensical for it to only be about that, given the instruction that wives are to submit to their husbands in the same way as to the Lord. And egalitarians point out that verse 21 says we're all supposed to submit to one another, and they say that doesn't make any sense that a husband's supposed to submit to everyone else in the church except his own wife. And complementarians say verse 22, 21 isn't connected with verse 22, and that's a separate passage. And then people write articles about where the paragraph starts and ends because the ancient manuscripts aren't great about indenting paragraphs. And around and around and around and around we go, arguing the text says one thing and not another, railing against what we think the text does or doesn't say, or railing against how Christians or society seem to just not care about what it says or about the authority of God's Word. And again, I actually think a lot of this is important work. I, I am so deeply thankful for folks uh, like our own Jim Davis and New Testament scholars who spend hours and hours of study trying to help us to get what lies behind a text. But sometimes I wonder if it causes us to lose the plot just a little bit. This is a sermon, not a lecture, and that means a couple things. One, I don't have quite as long to talk about this as I might if it were a lecture, and all the people said amen. But two, we're not approaching this academically as a subject to be dissected. We're, we're trying to see how the Word of God intersects with our daily living, our formation as resurrection Easter people. If this passage is doing anything, it's communicating to us that all of those beautiful theological truths we learned in the first half of Ephesians, they aren't just for seminaries or for Sunday morning sermons or lofty books of theology to read. They have to do with how we live our lives every day, what our relationships look like, what our households look like, and, and friendships, and, and what our churches look like. One thing that is sometimes missed with this and similar passages in Paul is that he's taking up an ancient genre and he's subverting it a little bit. Uh, there is some conjecture among scholars in the early church with uh, Jesus elevating the status of women in his ministry in a way uh, that was totally unique in both the Jewish and Roman world. And even with Paul saying things like, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Uh, there's some, some conjecture that this had started to lead some women to begin flaunting this freedom with outright rejection of their husbands, creating a sort of chaos in the communities and families. Uh, that's conjecture, but one thing we can be reasonably certain of is Paul is drawing on an ancient genre called the household code, uh, which many, many ancient authors had contributed to. Uh, beginning, I think Aristotle's probably the first one to do it. The household code says this, the family's the building block of society, and here is what that looks like. Household, we need to say in the ancient world, is not the nuclear family as we conceive of it today, uh, which is often geared toward, I don't know, making each other happy. It's multi-generational. Uh, it includes aunts and uncles and, and grandparents and servants and slaves all under one roof. And Paul writes into this genre in some unexpected ways. Uh, he doesn't begin with addressing the head, the so-called superordinate of the household. He begins addressing what it, at first appears the, to be the subordinates. This is not the common practice. But then he subverts what subordination is. Instead of giving practical instruction to the husband about how to manage and keep order and authority and how to rule effectively, he spends all of his time instructing husbands about sacrificing, giving oneself up. Remember, as we said last week for Paul, everything, everything in this world needs to be reinterpreted through the lens of the cross. 
So as we let go a little bit of trying to make the text make sense to us and instead see if we can let the text make sense of us, I want to focus on four word pairings this morning. Mystery and metaphor, leave and cleave, sin and sanctification, submission and sacrifice. Mystery and metaphor, leave and cleave, sin and sanctification, submission and sacrifice. And I want to look at how these words work themselves out in marriage, but not just in marriage, in in relationships. Uh, We're not all married here, of course, but we are all in human relationships. Uh, Marriage is a particularly intense expression of human relationship, but there there is much that carries over into any intimate relationship. So you don't just get to turn off if you're not married. I want to explore a bit how that enables us to see Christ's love in deeper ways. So first, mystery and metaphor. Paul says marriage is a profound mystery. Now, our text, I know, said significant allegory, which I think misses the point a little bit, but it's trying to convey the sense of symbol or metaphor. Uh, Marriage, we might also say, is sacramental. Um, At the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, we're participating in something tangible and real, which is sufficient unto itself, but is also communicating something more real to us. Marriage is like that, says Paul. It's a mystery, and it's a metaphor. Uh, Kathleen Norris, the writer and poet, she reflects, I read the end of Ephesians 5 as an example of what happens when you discover a metaphor so elusive you know it must be true. After sputtering on for a good long while, trying to make explicit the comparison between marriage and Christ's love for the church, finally Paul gives up and says, this is a great mystery. As you elaborate, try to explain, you begin to stumble over words and their meanings. Finally, you have to say, I don't know what it means, but here it is. Or Eugene Peterson writes, a metaphor, instead of pinning down meaning, lets it loose. The metaphor does not so much tightly define or label as it does expand. And maybe that's part of our problem, too. Paul is saying, let me tell you about this extraordinary mystery called marriage, which is a window into something even more extraordinary called Christ's love for the church. And we get stuck in the first couple verses trying to systematize everything, as as if we could then easily slap that onto the messiness of our lives and marriages if we just got the system perfectly articulated. Paul is pushing us to live the mystery of the Christian life. He has articulated the extraordinary grace of God in the opening chapters. And now he is saying, here is one way you can taste that grace, not by reading or listening to a sermon, but by living. Just like a really good poem or novel, so too marriage and and human relationships are a mystery, layers of meaning at different moments in life. Oh, this is what Christ's love looks like, mystery and metaphor. Now, the second word pairing, leave and cleave, uh, leave and cleave. In our text, it says be united to because people just don't really use the word cleave anymore. Uh, But I like the rhyme of the old King James Version, leave and cleave, be united to. Paul is quoting the beginning of Genesis here, and this may be a a good example of something that doesn't offend us at all, but might offend other cultures, uh, in the same way that we're offended by certain things in Scripture that other cultures don't even bat an eye at. We're used to leaving our parents, setting off on our own course and career and trajectory. Spouse or not, there's a million other things that we'll cleave to. But in many traditional societies, your duty to your parents is paramount. And this leave and cleave command doesn't negate that duty, but it does prioritize the marriage relationship in significant ways. In fact, I'd argue that it's an invitation to something harder. Now, we may not have those same societal expectations, but anyone who's been married knows how difficult this is. Each partner brings in, knowingly and unknowingly, a whole lot of family identity and expectations. That's your job to do that. Why why is it my job? I I had never really thought about it. I guess my dad always did that, or my mom always did that, so I just assumed that you would. We bring in the good things, and we bring in the the bad things, and we bring the things we love, and we bring the things we don't love. Um, I heard someone use the example, my parents made me go to church. I hated it, so we're never going to church. But you're not evaluating church as a thing in and of itself. You're bringing your parents into that decision, what you did or didn't like about what they did. We see how our parents treated each other, and without even realizing that, we mimic it for better and worse. 
Now, of course, we'll bring those things in. The question is, if we're able to notice those things and be willing to leave them, if the cleaving, the uniting of the marriage requires it. This could be incredibly damaging to marriages and relationships, an inability or an unwillingness to leave a parent in order to be united to their spouse. Uh, marriage, in many ways, uh, then, is, is a fresh slate. In this way, it is so much like the Christian life. In baptism, you die to your old self. You leave your old self, and you are giving a new identity, a new self, a self that is marked not by sin and shame, but belovedness in Christ. You cleave to Christ. Now, for some of you, that that metaphor resonates. You came from a hostile home and, and the fresh start of marriage from abuse and sin and shame to belovedness. This is lovely. But some of you are saying, wait, So my parents are my old sinful self, but they're lovely. Don't talk about my mother that way, Pastor Tyler. Of course. And again, don't over-systematize a metaphor or a mystery. Because no matter how wonderful and lovely your parents may have been, there are still going to be things of your old self that you'll need to let go of in this marriage. And as we know with the Christian life, just because we are baptized and go to church doesn't mean that the old sinful self doesn't just keep creeping back in. Every day it's creeping back in. And we have to remind ourselves, that's not who I am anymore. And so too with marriage. We haven't fully left and then cleaved to our spouse on our wedding day. It's a lifelong process. We're always pulling things from our past back in, which can create all sorts of conflict. And some of the things that we we pull in from our, our past, we find are beautiful, and they're to be kept, and others are to be shed. And again, this is not unique to marriage. We pull in our pasts into all our relationships. I'm suspicious of this person because they remind me of my dad, and he was so cruel, so this person must be cruel too. What does it mean to leave that past so that there's a possibility of a relationship with this totally new person moving forward? So don't leave the service today and say, well, I'm never talking to my parents again, and anything that looks remotely like tradition from my childhood, we're cutting it out. That would be a colossal misunderstanding. True leaving is more work than that, and actually, it often strengthens a relationship with parents. It's discovering what needs to be set aside uh, and, and how you relate to your spouse so that the marriage can flourish. But it offers that fresh slate just like the Christian life does. This is who you are now, leave the old self, cleave to Christ as you cleave to your spouse. So we have mystery and metaphor. We have leave and cleave. And thirdly, we have sin and sanctification. There may be no better way to discover your sins, your selfishness, your flaws than to get married. Exposes them quickly. Because they start crashing into the sins, the selfishness, the flaws of someone else. You start to say, wow, this person I'm married to has a lot of problems they need to work through. And they start to say, wow, this person I'm married to really has a lot of problems they need to work through. And if you have any measure of self-awareness at all, you also discover that you are capable of rudeness that you didn't know you were capable of. You find yourself saying words that you intend to be cruel or wounding, and you think, what? I didn't know that ugliness was in my soul. I always thought of myself as a pretty good person and more virtuous than most, but not after that argument. And if you've taken that marriage covenant vow seriously, then you think, oh no, we're in this for the long haul. We have no choice but to work through it. And that means I have no choice but to grow up. That's what Sanctification is becoming more holy, becoming more like Christ, growing up into who you actually are, holy and sanctified. Marriage, again, is maybe the most intense expression of this, but these discoveries happen in friendship too, don't they? Now, verse 26 says, Christ made his bride, the church, holy by giving himself up for her, by washing her in the word. What human has made the greatest impact on my sanctification, my becoming more holy, more like Christ? Brittany, without a doubt. Why? Because in grace, she won't just endlessly tolerate my selfishness or my pride, dismiss it as just okay. And in grace and in love, she also won't let those ugly moments define who I am in her eyes. Do you have a friend or a spouse like that? Are you a friend or a spouse like that? There's a lovely New Testament word, 
logizomai, reckoned. Uh, It's not used here, but Paul certainly used it elsewhere. God reckoned it to them as righteousness. Uh, There's a sense with it that God reckons us as something, and we become that something. God reckons us as good, even though we're not. But we start to become that. If God says you are good, says you are beloved, then you are good. You are beloved. And so in the grace, a spouse shows the other in marriage. This is true. We are reckoned by our beloved as lovely and lovable in our moments where we seem to be acting like the opposite of it, and we grow into becoming more lovely and lovable. Sin and sanctification, when the ugliest parts of us have been exposed and we, and we can't take it back, it's, it's, there it is, and we're so deeply ashamed in our spouse, the very one we've hurt, the very one we've wounded, the very one we've betrayed, our spouse or our friend says, I forgive you, I love you. When in our, our extraordinary unloveliness, we are reckoned as who we are, we begin to become again who we are, beloved, lovely, beautiful. And then we realize that this is a glimpse into the way Christ loves us who even more than our spouse or our close friend we've betrayed sees not just the parts that we present to everyone else, but sees the most wicked parts of us. And seeing all of that still says to us, I forgive you. I love you. Marriage is a profound mystery. This is the being made holy, the being washed by the water and the word that Paul's talking about, the cleansing waters of baptism, the forgiveness we can feel in the love of our spouse, and it's so often their love which God uses to make us holy. Fourth, submission and sacrifice. I was thankful for the testimony from the author Rebecca McLaughlin, uh, which I'll now quote She says, I was an undergrad at Cambridge when I first wrestled with Paul's instruction in Ephesians for wives to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, and I was repulsed. I had three problems with this passage. The first was that wives should submit. I knew women were just as competent as men. My second problem was with the idea that wives should submit to their husbands as to the Lord. It's one thing to submit to Jesus Christ, the self-sacrificing king of the universe. It's quite another to offer that kind of submission to a fallible, sinful man. My third problem was the idea that the husband was the head of the wife. This seemed to imply a hierarchy at odds with men and women's equal status as image bearers of God from Genesis. Jesus, in countercultural fashion, had elevated women. Paul, it seemed, pushed them back down. At first, I tried to explain the shock away. But then I trained my lens on the command to husbands. The Ephesians passage began to come into focus. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? By dying on a cross, by giving himself, naked and bleeding to suffer for her, by putting her needs above his own, by sacrificing everything for her. I asked myself how I would feel if this were the command to wives. Ephesians 5.22 is sometimes critiqued as a mandate for spousal abuse. Tragically, it has been misused that way. But the command to husband makes that reading impossible. How much more easily could an abuser have twisted a verse if it were calling for the wife to suffer for him like Christ, to give herself up for him, to die for him? When I realized the lens for this teaching was the lens of the gospel itself, it started making sense. If the message of Jesus is true, no one comes to the table with rights. The only way to enter is flat on your face, male or female. If we grasp at our right to self-determination, authority, and power, we must reject Jesus because he calls us to submit to him completely. With this lens in place, I saw that God created sex and marriage as a telescope to give us a glimpse of his star-sized desire for intimacy with us. I think a fear that people may have with this passage is that there will be some big decision in a marriage, maybe whether to move and take a job, maybe where to send the kids to school, maybe what color curtains you're going to get. And the husband and wife will disagree, and the wife will see this in Ephesians and say, I have to submit so my husband gets final say. Bad choice on the color of curtains. Don't, uh. <laughs> the problem is that hierarchy... And competition is so much part of the world that we live in and the air we breathe that we're almost certain to get hung up on the wrong things. But what if we go to the nature of God as revealed in Scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ? 
we have to go to the Trinitarian nature of God. In trying to describe something as mysterious and vast as the nature of God, we use language that we could mistake easily for hierarchy. This is what Christian theologians say. The Father eternally begets the Son, and the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. So, the, the Father is the highest? No. <laughs> Christian theologians, that's heresy. Christian theology has always vehemently insisted against a hierarchy to the Trinity. Jesus Christ models for us submission and sacrifice. Jesus says numerous times that he submits to the will of his Father who sent him. What does that mean? Does it mean Christ's subjugation? No, it's precisely in Jesus' submission that he finds himself exalted. And what does it mean that Christ gave up his life for his bride, the church? That he died on a cross? Well, yes, but it's more than that. It's so much more than that. Ask yourself, where in Scripture do you ever see Christ serving his own needs, looking after his own interests? There might be a couple examples, but you can count them on one hand. I mean, like, is it ever? All Christ is doing on the pages of the Gospels is looking after the needs of those around him and attending to the will of his Father who sent him. Paul is trying to make explicit, to elaborate a mystery that is beyond words, a metaphor that's so elusive it must be true. And we've taken it as a way to pit husbands and wives against each other and complain that Paul is a misogynist, and, and we just miss out on the mystery of Christ's love. I just don't see how this passage turns so quickly to discussions of leadership and authority and power. Philippians 2, adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There's a word in Christian theology to describe the relationship of the Trinity called perichoresis. And without going into the full etymology of that term, uh, one of the chief things to understand about it is that it's often spoken about like a dance, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons engaged so intimately and fluidly in this eternal dance of love, this submission and sacrifice and exaltation of the, of the other that to onlookers, it's, it's difficult to discern sometimes who is who. So perfectly in sync are they, moving. This is a picture of marriage, or rather, marriage is a picture of that, a two-personed love, an ongoing dance of submission and sacrifice where one partner submits and finds in this she's exalted above. And I would say that marriage becomes a three-personed love where both partners grow so attuned not only to the other's will and needs, but especially to God's will, and their will becomes indistinguishable from one another's and from their creators. Now, of course... No human marriage will ever have the full beauty of the eternal triune dance. Uh, it will very often look like how I look when I try to actually dance. Uh, Brittany can tell you I'm, I'm stumbling and stepping on toes and forgetting the next step and storming off in frustration. Goodness knows the church is often a poor dance partner for Christ, our husband. But in the church, as in marriage, there are moments where you lose yourself in the dance and onlookers see the beauty and can barely distinguish between you and your spouse, between Christ and his church. They see the beauty, the fluidity, the give and take, the submission and sacrifice, and in those moments, you discover God's beauty and grace and love in new ways, like returning to an old poem and finding yet another layer of meaning in its metaphors. The more we learn submission and sacrifice, the more often those moments will come. A mentor of mine told a story of a couple in his first church, pillars of the church, good, faithful people. The husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and eventually he had to be moved to a care facility. Every single day, his wife would go visit him as his memory, his mental acuity did, deteriorated. And my mentor went to pay him a visit one day and found that he wasn't in his room. So he looked around the facility and found the two of them in the courtyard. And his wife was wiping from his face some food that, that had dribbled down. Every day, she went to him. My mentor said, I was moved to tears at the realization that this is an image of God's love for me. Not when we're put together and beautiful and, and maybe young on our wedding day, but when our bodies fail us, our minds fail us, or maybe when we're just at our worst, God reaches out with that napkin and wipes the dribble off of our faces. That God would love us in 
that way. Dying on a cross, giving himself naked and bleeding to suffer for us, his bride, by putting our needs above his own again and again and again. Coming not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many, as a ransom for you. That God would put people in our lives, a spouse, a friend, who love us in this way. That God would call us to love others in this way. This, this is a profound mystery. Let's pray. God, your love is just so vast that one lifetime is not nearly enough. One eternity is not nearly enough to plunge its meaning, to experience its fullness. And so vast is it that in your grace you have given us tangible things like marriage, that we can experience that in ways that are a little easier for us to grasp. So, Lord, we pray for the relationships in this church. We pray for the marriages in this church. That as we look to your perichoretic dance, that our relationships, our church, our marriages would mimic that, that we would discover the beauty, the fluidity of that, wrapped up in your will and serving you. We ask this in your name. Amen. singing over me You have been so so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so so Serve it, still you give yourself.
There are elders and deacons available to pray with you uh, this door, the Witherspoon Chapel up here on the left-hand side of the sanctuary uh, right after the service. Friends, receive now the benediction. The Lord your God is with you. And friends, He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. Thank you.